Pastor Jared's already confirmed it, and I just love it when the Lord confirms his will to us. Turn with us, if you would please, to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we will find our opening text this morning. We're going to start out, first of all, in 1 Samuel, and then we'll move right over to 2 Samuel. But here we find two very familiar stories this morning in both of our texts. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we'll begin reading at verse 41. So the Philistine came. Now this is referring to the giant named Goliath. How many remember the story of the giant Goliath? Stood some nine feet, nine inches tall. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David... He disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Woo! How many know who that name is this morning? (laughs) I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Boy, could you imagine being a little mouse at this and just observing the the, the talk here between the two? Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. How many know David was fearless? He was totally fearless in this situation. And then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it. Let me just stop right there. Does anybody know why, why David was fearless in this situation? Because God had already proven himself to him. He had a history with a supernatural working God. Can anybody say amen? So then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the giant, the Philistine, in his forehead, So that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Think of that. David went to battle, but how many know he couldn't wear the king's armor because it was too big? It didn't fit. How many know you got to go in God's power and God's strength? Amen. There was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his own sword, drew it out of his sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Wow, can somebody say praise the Lord? (laughs) Woo! What an amazing story here this morning. Now let's go to 2 Samuel. And there we find that David is now king. Because remember, if you will, when David kills Goliath, he was merely a little shepherd boy. In other words, he was anointed, but not yet appointed. Anybody going to help me preach this morning? (laughs) But then, 28 years later, we find David over here in 2 Samuel, And now he's the king. And now the roles are somewhat switched. He's been appointed, but now he's struggling with his anointing. Mm. 
Look at your neighbor this morning and tell him you got to guard your anointing. You got to guard your anointing. All right, here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 11. 28 years later, David is now king. The little shepherd boy is now king. It says, and it happened. In the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened. One evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Jordan V., I'm going to ask that you ask the blessing over the reading of God's word today in our time together in the word. Let's pray along with him, Brother Jordan. Thank you, Jesus. Speak to our hearts today, Father. Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So in 1 Samuel, we see that the young shepherd boy named David kills the giant named Goliath. When everybody was afraid to go out and go toe-to-toe, face-to-face with the giant, David volunteered his services. He prevailed over the giant. But then we fast forward some 28 years later to 2 Samuel. And we see now the shepherd boy named David is king over Israel. He was first anointed king, then he was appointed king. He's been in the position for some 20 years now as king. And how many know when we're in situations for a while, we tend to get comfortable? We tend to get laxed. We tend to get careless. The title of our message this morning is this. Goliath or Bathsheba? Who was the real giant? Who was the real giant? David, the little humble shepherd boy, defeated the mighty giant named Goliath. But David, the mighty king of Israel, lost to Bathsheba. Proving to us here today that the real giants that we are facing are the desires that we have not yet killed. Any humans here today? Notice what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 26. He says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing But the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. As Christians who still live in flawed, weak, and sinful human flesh, it's important to know that we must position ourselves for success. We, 
as individuals. We must position our own selves for success. In other words, there are things that we can do to help ourselves. How many know sometimes we're our own worst enemy? One of the things that we can do as a believer to help ourselves is to simply not put ourselves into the wrong place at the wrong time. How many have ever found yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time? <laughs> yeah. This is exactly what happened to King David here in 2 Samuel. Let's look at it again here, verse number 1. It says, and it happened. In the springtime of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle. Now that's what David was. David was a king. At the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. King David should have been on the battlefield leading his troops into battle. But instead, he's back at the palace shooting the breeze and kicking the bobos. In other words, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Can anybody say amen? Now, it, it's not found in the Bible, but we've all heard this saying, an idle mind is a, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. And at the springtime of the year when King David should have been busy, when he should have been leading his troops into battle, he had an idle mind. Back to verse 2. Then it happened. Everybody say, then it happened. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Notice here how it says one evening. David arose from his bed on one evening. Now this is another red flag because it shows to us here some laziness on the part of King David. It doesn't say one night that David arises from his bed, but one evening. If it would have been of nighttime, then it would have been dark out, right? I mean, it's the springtime of the year, so the days are starting to get longer. And if it would have been dark, then David wouldn't have been able to see Bathsheba. But it's in the early evening. It's still light. He sees Bathsheba. It's early evening and the king is lounging. He has an idle mind. Or on the other hand, let's just say it was nighttime. And if it was nighttime or normal bed hours, then what was King David doing out strolling on the roof time, rooftop in the night? Either way, we look at it, David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time because he should have been on the battlefield. Remember that old hymn, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. How many know we got to stay on the battlefield, church? We got to keep ourselves on the battlefield. Now, at this time, David was at the height of his reign. He had been walking with God in victory, after victory, after victory. For 20 years, he had been king of Israel, and now he was not just anointed king, but he was appointed king. And it wasn't an accident that David was in the king's palace, but he was there by design. The first king of Israel was Saul. 
And Saul was the king right before David. Saul was the people's choice, but David was God's choice. Now that's going to be key in all this. Because we know Saul messed up, right? We could blame that on the people because that Saul was the people's choice. But David was God's choice. Hello? David was God's choice. But how many know David still messed up? Mm. So you see, it wasn't like David wasn't supposed to be there. But he was anointed king, and then he was appointed king. But again, it's the fact that the king got complacent. He got too comfortable in his palace. He got too comfortable in his kingdom. And really, if the truth be known, he got too used to winning in battle. Well, I don't really need to go out with the fellows and fight. We're going to win anyway. How many know presumption will get you in trouble every time? David even got too used to winning. So much so that he didn't even deem it necessary for him to even be on the battlefield. You see, there's something about continual winning and constant victories that lull us into complacency or pride. And that's why our enemies always serve a purpose. Was it Pastor Josh that preached a message one time, the necessity of an enemy, I think? (laughs) You see, our enemies keep us alert. They keep us sharp. They keep us on our toes, or should I say, they keep us on our knees. (laughs) Hello? But please, don't get me wrong, because David was a good man. In fact, the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart, that very same David. That very same David. But yet, even good men, And even good women can make mistakes. Hello? I said even good men and good women can make mistakes. Anybody ever made a mistake? I've made plenty. Just ask my wife. Try to make one every day just to keep her on her toes. David was a good man. He just simply lost his focus. He let his guard down. His priorities shifted. David was Israel's poet and singer. He wrote many of the Psalms. David was a worshiper. How many know David was a worshiper? He even danced before the Lord with all of his might. Remember the story? Mm. But yet on that one evening, the evening that he should have been on the battlefield, the evening that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, That evening. Everybody say that evening. That evening, David was captivated by someone else's wife. Now again, this was not an, an immoral man. This was not a man who wanted to fall. I don't believe David was looking to fail by any means whatsoever. But this was a man who put himself in a vulnerable position and let down his own guard.
David was the man who killed both a lion and a bear as he guarded his sheep, yet he failed to guard his own heart. Did we get that? David was willing to give his life for his sheep back years ago when he was a little shepherd boy. He killed both a lion and a bear while he guarded his sheep, but now he fails to guard his own heart. David was the man who killed the giant Goliath 28 years before. But now he succumbs to his own fleshly desire. Oh yes, David was the man who killed the lion, the bear, and the giant, yet he lost to Bathsheba. You see, my friend, the real giant in David's life wasn't Goliath, and it wasn't even Bathsheba, but the real giant was his untamed lust. Now, sometimes, or I would say most of the time, we know what our weaknesses are. We know what we're dealing with. We know what we struggle with. But how many know sometimes there's things that flare up in our lives that we don't even realize was there? Woo! And we're like, oh, wow, where did that come from? Any humans here today? Come on, don't get religious on me. I know you ain't all that in a bag of chips. If you don't think so, I'll come live with you and I'll bring the devil out of you. Come on. Here today, we could very easily jump on the bandwagon of let's talk crazy about King David. Let's condemn King David for his actions. Because not only the adultery with Bathsheba, but the murder of her husband, Uriah. Who? Proving the point that one sin always leads to a, another sin. One sin to try to cover up the other sin, right? You know the story. You know what happened. But the truth is, all of us here today are facing some kind of giant. And there's a really good chance that it's not a nine foot, nine inch soldier named Goliath. No, the Bible says we wrestle not with flesh and blood. How many old people aren't your enemies? No, I promise you, old girl, old boy, they're not your enemy. It's the spirit behind them. That's why the Bible says we wrestle not with flesh and blood. But there is a really good chance that we're facing giants today with names like lust, addiction, greed, selfishness, pride, unforgiveness, gossip, pornography, Gambling, and the list goes on and on. Anybody going to say amen this morning? Come on. Or maybe our giants are of a little different nature. Perhaps they have names like depression, anxiety, fear, doubt, unbelief, confusion, discouragement, distraction, complacency, or even lukewarmness. Well, that's a huge giant to the church of today. The truth is, there are a whole host of giants wanting to take you and I out today. (laughs) The devil, as a roaring lion, is what? Going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. If David was no... match for the enemy, if Samson was no match for the enemy, why do we think we in ourselves are a match for the enemy? You see, the minute we let our guard down, the minute we allow ourselves to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's when the giant will strike. 
That's when the giant will strike. We can never defeat the giant. Now listen to this. You might want to write this down. We can never defeat the giant that we're unwilling to confront. Does that make sense? In other words, we'll never be able to conquer what we're unwilling to admit or confront. But how many know we got to face our giants head on, just like David did? Look at your neighbor and tell him, you can't run from this, honey. You can't run from her. you got to face it head on. Now, we know the devil never plays fair. The giant of temptation never plays fair, right? He never hits us where we're strong. Oh, no, the devil is smarter than that. He would, he would never waste his time doing that. But the giant of temptation always hits us where we're weak. And you say, well, Steve, how does the devil know my weakness? Well, honey, at some point in time, we've done this. Whoop! We've revealed our weakness to him. And when we do that, he's like, now I got him. Now I know where to hit him. Look at your neighbor and remind him we all have our weaknesses. The giant of temptation always hits us where we're weak. How many know when Jesus was fasting 40 days and 40 nights, the devil come to tempt him? And what did he tempt him with? His hunger. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? Hmm. Yeah, we all have weaknesses. But thank God that in our weakness, he becomes our strength for us. How many know it's our weaknesses that summons the grace of God on our behalf? It's our weaknesses that remind us that we need a holy God. Woo! Honey, it's my weakness every day when I wake up that reminds me I need Jesus today. (laughs) Woo! God will literally become strength for us in the midst of our weakness. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Isaiah and said this in Isaiah chapter 54. He says, how many weapons? No weapon. Everybody say no weapon. Now notice now it doesn't say that no weapons are going to be formed. Oh, they're going to be formed. And the, and the devil's going to fire shots at us, right? Hello? But watch this. No weapon formed against you shall what? Prosper. Huh. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Wow. <laughs> No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Now, I know we're not supposed to add to or take away from the word, but can I add just a little something to what Isaiah says here? No weapon formed against you, including your flesh, shall prosper. Because how many know most of the time our flesh is our worst enemy? So no enemy, no weapon formed against it, even if it is our flesh, is going to prosper. We just missed a good place to shout right there. Come on, somebody. Woo! Mm. <laughs> Now, if we follow the story closely from this point on, after Bathsheba, we know that the rest of 2 Samuel is filled with chaos, confusion, rape, rebellion, polygamy, death, and a whole host of sin and its consequences. 
simply because of David's sin. But how many are thankful today that we serve the God of restoration? (laughs) Especially in this age of grace. How many are thankful that you were born in the age of grace? Come on. That's a really good place to shout right there. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how many times we've been in the wrong place at the wrong time, when we're ready to make a change, we serve the God of restoration. Can anybody say praise the Lord? He's the God of Joel chapter 2, amen, the God of restoration. Now, if we fast forward, you need to probably read second, all of Second Samuel up through this, but if we... Fast forward to chapter 24 for the sake of time. We see that David once again sinned against God. <laughs> How many know as humans we're, we're going we're gonna to mess up? But once again in chapter 24 we see David sinned when he numbered the people. And let's pick it up real quick here in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 14. And David said to the prophet Gad, which Gad was David's seer, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. (laughs) Boy, he said it right there. We said this past Wednesday night in Bible study, the judgments of God are always righteous judgments. And and I'm in total agreement with David here. I don't want man to judge me. I want God to judge me. Because you know what? Whatever I got coming from God, I'm going to get coming because he's a fair and just judge. Can anybody say amen? Amen. So when David said this, let us fall into the hand of the Lord... Look what happens here in verse 15. He says, So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. How many know the wages of sin is what? Death. Wow. And when the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. It's going to be important here in a minute. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, surely I have sinned. And I have done wickedly. And and that's one of the reasons why I believe David was called a man after God's own heart. Was not just the fact that he was a worshiper. That even though when he did sin, he was quick to repent. How many know you got to be quick to repent when you sin? Surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Notice here how David reverts back to his days of being a little shepherd boy. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came to that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Urana the Jebusite. And so David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded Now Urana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. And so Urana went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Urana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Urana said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. 
All these, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Then David said to Arana, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which with that which cost me nothing. How many know true worship is costly? True worship is costly. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord, what? Heeded the prayers for the land. And the plague was withdrawn from Israel. I want to show you here now how God works. We say this all the time. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. We say this often, there isn't anything that happens in our lives. There's no choices or decisions that we make that ever take God by surprise. We also say God uses the what? The good, the bad, and the ugly. All of what we see here in chapter 24 takes place at the threshing floor of a Urana, the Jebusite. And when David goes to buy the threshing floor so he can build an altar in order that the plague would be withdrawn, this time, everybody say this time, this time David finds himself at the right place at the right time. (laughs) the right place at the right time. Does anybody want to guess what piece of land this is that David just purchased? David just bought Mount Moriah, which was the place where Abraham once offered his son Isaac, which would become the very spot that would be the location where David's son, King Solomon, would one day build the temple of the Most High God. Can anybody say hallelujah? You see, in all of that, God was working a process. He was working his plan. (laughs) Even in a bunch of them, A big mess God was working. All things together for our good. (laughs) So this time David finds himself in the right place at the right time. God allowed Satan's wickedness in. He allowed David's sin to run their course until it was time to execute God's divine plan. You say, Steve, are you saying that sin is part of God's plan? No, but he allows allows us to do what we're going to do. Because he's not going to take our free will choice from us. But in the midst of us being us, how many are thankful that God is going to use us in spite of ourselves? Come on, somebody. In spite of our mistakes, in spite of our disobedience, God's going to work his plan no matter what. (laughs) And so God allows Satan to run rampant and David's sin to run its course until it was time to execute the plan. So the threshing floor became a.k.a. Mount Moriah, it became Israel's most holiest site. Think of that. 
So what that means is the fact that out of adultery, out of murder, out of polygamy, out of rape, chaos and confusion and a whole bunch of sin came restoration. Came God's plan being executed anyhow. (laughs) Because how many know nothing's going to stop God's will and his plan and purpose for mankind and planet earth? No, we can't stop that. Out of broken relationships, marriages, and trust came a flawed man, a flawed king. His name was David. And from David and his wife Bathsheba came King Solomon. Mm. the wisest man to ever live outside of Jesus himself. I'd say that's not pretty bad. Not pretty bad. I mean, if you're going to have a kid, come on. And out of King Solomon came the temple of the Most High God. Such a beautiful edifice. Amazing. But there is one even greater than Solomon who came from the lineage of David and Bathsheba. What seemed like a wrecked life, a wrecked marriage, a wrecked kingdom. Out of the lineage of David and Bathsheba comes a man named Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah. Proving to you and I today there's hope for every one of us. Come on, somebody. We just missed a good place to shout right there. (laughs) Even Jesus himself came from that lineage. Proving to us here today that God uses the good... He blesses us when we get it right, but you know what? He's patient with us when we get it wrong. What did we preach last week? The one who knows us the best loves us the most. Mm. Mm. We said it last Sunday. I think we repeated it Wednesday. I'm going to repeat it again today. There isn't anything good that we can do that will make God love us any more than he already does. His love cannot be earned. This salvation cannot be earned. And on the other hand, there's there's not an evil thing that we can do that that can make him love us any less. How many is thankful for the love of God today? So David defeated Goliath the giant, but he lost to Bathsheba. But in God's infinite grace and mercy, he shows to us his love and his forgiveness to mankind. Wow. Wow. And even when we make a mess of everything, God can still use us if we just simply humble ourselves and repent and say, like David, God, I need your help. Let me build an altar right here. The bad thing about the church today is When we do wrong, we try to get away with it. We try to justify it. We try to blame it on somebody else. (laughs) Well, if she wouldn't have said that. Well, the devil made me do it. That's a popular one, right? The devil devil ain't make you do anything, honey. Come on. Anybody getting anything out of this today? It's real stuff, isn't it? This is where we live. And as humans, when you add us to the element, when you add us to the mix, I hate to say it, but we're going to get it wrong. We're going to mess it up. We put our hands on it, it's going to be flawed. But God. But God. 
Look at your neighbor and just remind them, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. This is just a season. We're going to come out bigger, better, bolder on the other side, right? If God be for me, who can be against me? Remember that from last week? <laughs> Praise team, you can come, please. I need to land this plane here. Perhaps you're here today and you're facing a giant. Most chances are his name isn't Goliath, even though it seems like it sometimes. Perhaps you're facing a giant of lust, greed, addiction, fear, anxiety, depression. The truth is it doesn't matter what the giant is. But what really matters is the fact that today we cut off the head of the giant. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We just don't knock him down with our stone, but once he goes down, we go run over there. We grab his sword and we cut off the very head. How many know often two times as believers we just deal with the symptoms and not the root cause? we got to cut off his head. Because you see, if we'll remain faithful, God will turn our mess into a message. He'll turn our test into a testimony. Anybody ever had a test before? Come on. He'll turn our waste into wonders. He'll turn our junk into jewels. But we've got to be faithful. We can't give up. When we fall, when we fail, and we're going to make mistakes, we're going to do that. We got to get back up. We got to keep loving. We got to keep forgiving. We got to keep doing what we know to do. <laughs> Aren't you thankful we don't have to be perfect? Jesus did that for us. Come on, somebody. How many know we'd all be disqualified if we had to be perfect? <laughs> we don't have to be perfect, but we, we, we do need to keep trying. We do need to keep pressing towards the mark. And you know what? I'm not even trying to be perfect anymore because I, I realize, you know what? I'm never going to attain that. But you know what I want to be like? I want to be like Jesus. Just want to be like Jesus. Just want to love people, love God, do the right thing. I just got to keep trying, keep being faithful. When I fall, I can't stay down. We've said it many times before, the devil doesn't know what to do with the person who won't give up. Listen, every time you keep going on and you keep picking yourself up and you keep getting up, you know how mad you make the devil? You know how much you confound him and say, man, I thought I had her that time. I thought I had him this time. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Woo. What Satan meant for evil, God can turn it around for the good. And some of the stuff that we, some of us have been through, we probably shouldn't be here today. Any testimonies? Some of us should have probably been dead already. Come on. Some of us probably should have been in prison or something. But God. <laughs> but God. Mm. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. I love what Brother Donnie said yes, or last Sunday. They come in there to the office, and I'm apologizing, you know. Sorry, guys, we, we need to reschedule. The water's so cold. Brother Donnie's like, oh, uh-uh, listen here. I've come too far to turn back now. Come on, somebody. How many know we got to make up our mind like Joshua of old? That's for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to do the right thing. From this point on, we're going forward. 
We ain't going backwards. We ain't looking back. Hey, I'm pressing towards the mark. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. My Lord. <laughs> Every time David sinned, he came to his senses. He repented. So, oh God, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to make this right? Whew. How many are ready to cut off the head of your giant today? Come on, you just don't want to knock him down. We're not just going to knock him down and run away from him. But we're going to knock him down and we're going to run up on him. We're going to cut that head off. Woo, hallelujah. Stand with me if you would, please. One of the reasons why we can all identify with a message like this is because we've all been there and done that. We've all fallen short of the grace of God. And you know, David is one of those men that when I get to heaven, I want to go up and I want to shake his hand. I say, Steve, why would you want to do that? He messed up. Oh, yeah, he messed up all right. But he didn't give up. See, what I see about David, if you really know the life of David, you know that he was a passionate man. He passionately worshipped God. He passionately danced before the Lord with all of his might. And this is what I found out about passionate people. Passionate people do things passionately. When they do it right, they do it passionately. But when they mess up, they mess up passionately. I don't know about you but I want to be a passionate person for Jesus. And I'm tired of passionately messing up and I'm ready to passionately do what's right. Can anybody say amen? I'm ready to passionately offer my body, my life, my ministry, my family, my everything. But you know what? We've got to find out what those giants are. We've got to confront them. We've got to cut off their head. If you're here today, you say, Steve, there's some things in my life that need to be cut off. I want you to come and we're going to stand in prayer and faith and agreement with you. And we're going to believe that the same God that delivered David is going to deliver us here today. How many know him as deliverer? Ooh, come on. Come on. I know the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts here today. Won't you come? Whatever the need is, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially, relationally, won't you come and let's believe God together.